Today, October 12th, I'm five feet tall. My whole name is Jacob Irvin Wetterling. My favorite food is steak. My favorite color is blue. My best friend is Aaron Larson. My favorite, I don't really have a favorite song. My favorite game is Clue. My favorite thing to do most is watch football. My favorite sport is football. And my favorite TV show is The Cosby Show. My, what I want to be when I grow up is a football player. My favorite hobby is collecting football cards. I don't have a favorite book, and my newest friend is Gabe. I'm finished. Jacob Irwin Wetterling was born on February 17, 1978, and was described as a sweet boy who was loved by all who knew him in the small town of St. Joseph, Minnesota. By age 11, he was in the fourth grade and was the goalie for his ice hockey team. On the morning of October 22, 1989, Jacob went fishing with his father, Jerry. After fishing, they spent the rest of the day watching the Vikings game and tossing a football around in the yard. Jacob's parents would leave the home that evening to attend a dinner party. Jacob was one of five children that lived in the house, and since their parents were planning only to be gone for a couple of hours, Jacob was allowed to have a friend come over. His friend was Aaron Larson, and they were excited to stay up late that Sunday night because they didn't have school the next day. Once their parents arrived at the dinner party, they called and left the phone number with the kids in case of an emergency. Jacob's 10-year-old brother, Trevor, called their parents back later and asked if the three of them could ride their bikes and scooter to the local Tom Thumb store to rent a video about a mile or so away. Patty Wetterling told him no, but once their father got on the phone, he told them they could go as long as they brought large flashlights so traffic could see them because it was dark. Then they called again to tell them they would ask the neighbor to babysit. This was the first time Jacob was able to ride his bike after dark to the store. The three boys traveled along 91st Avenue Southeast, a quiet dead-end road. They arrived at the store hoping to rent the Major League movie, but it was rented out, so they settled with Naked Gun and some candy. As Jacob, his brother, and his friend Aaron were almost back from the Tom Thumb convenience store, a man with a pistol concealing his face with a stocking cap mask stopped them as they walked near the driveway to the Rassier Farm. It was a little after 9 p.m. and very dark in the rural area, and their location was set back quite a ways from the road. The man told the boys to get off their bikes and scooters, toss them in the ditch, and lie face down on the ground. He then asked 10-year-old Trevor and 11-year-old Jacob and Aaron their ages. He told Jacob's brother Trevor to run toward a nearby wooded area and not look back or else he would be shot. He then demanded to view the faces of the two remaining boys. He picked Jacob and told Aaron to run away, threatening him like he had Trevor. But as the boys ran away, they ended up looking back to see that Jacob and the man were already gone. The boys ran back to Jacob and Trevor's home and frantically told a neighbor what had happened. At this point, they called the parents and gave them the heartbreaking news. Jacob had been kidnapped. Meanwhile, a neighbor named Kevin, who had a police scanner, heard the dispatcher's call and went straight to the scene. When he got there, authorities had not yet arrived. When a St. Joseph PD patrolman finally showed up, he told Kevin to leave the area. The officer assumed that Kevin was an onlooker, which was the case, but he was never questioned after the fact. If Kevin, the neighbor that was the first person to the scene, had been questioned initially, he could have told the investigators where he was when he heard the dispatcher, the route he took to the crime scene, and when he got there. But more importantly, he could have told them of any vehicles he passed coming from the direction of the crime scene. Then they could have determined if any reports of vehicles in the area were Kevin and his tires could have been compared with other tire tracks on the driveway. A bloodhound led officers to tire tracks, prompting them to believe the kidnapper had a car nearby that may have driven from the nearby interstate, and this would be their focus for the next 14 years or so. The police also noticed children's footprints leading a short distance up the driveway. 
they seem to have concluded that Jacob was taken to a vehicle in the driveway and driven away from there. An FBI profiler suggested the kidnapper was a white male between 25 and 35, likely a sex offender who was employed at an unskilled job and had a low self-image, probably stemming from a physical deformity such as acne or scars. For nearly 10 days, over 200 searchers scoured the area with canines, horseback, and helicopters. Finally, five days into the investigation, a sketch artist created an image of a man who attempted to abduct a boy in nearby Stearns County earlier that summer and also the 1970s Ford van he was driving. At that point, all resources are directed at a search for an unknown vehicle with an abducted child. But less than 48 hours after Jacob was kidnapped, a local high school sophomore walked into the Stearns County Sheriff's Office with his father and asked to meet with an investigator. The boy said that in the last year and a half to two years, there had been between seven and nine molestations in nearby Painesville. He said he personally witnessed two of the assaults and that someone grabbed the boys off their bikes and threatened them with a knife. The boy said the style of the attacks was similar to what happened to Jacob. He suggested that investigators talk to Officer Bill Drager at the Painesville Police Department. But Stearns County investigators didn't pursue the lead until January 5, 1990, nearly three months later. When they finally did, it led them straight to Danny Heinrich, a suspect in the Painesville cases. Heinrich was given a lie detector test, but failed regarding Jacob's abduction. A couple of days after Heinrich is interviewed about the Painesville assaults, Stearns County Sheriff's Detective Steve Mund photographed Sears brand tires on Heinrich's blue Ford EXP. Mund had created the plaster cast of the tire marks at the scene of Jacob's abduction and was also the investigator who, on October 30, 1989, had received an FBI crime lab report connecting the tracks to one of two types of Sears tires. In early 1990, investigators found only two sets of tire matches throughout the investigation. One was Heinrich's, and the other came from a car that was broken down and hadn't been driven in a while. Though many possible suspects were ruled out based on the non-matching tires, it seems that Heinrich's tires didn't rule him in, even though he drove the only car that could be connected to the crime scene. Investigators had convinced Heinrich to stand in a lineup for three boys, two of which had reported seeing a suspicious man in a car near the Wetterling's house the week before his abduction, and a boy named Jared Shirell. Jared was a 12-year-old boy who was abducted nine months before Jacob, 10 miles away in the nearby town of Cold Spring. Jared was walking down the street only three blocks from home when a car pulled up and stopped. The driver asked Jared for directions before jumping out of the car and grabbing him by the shoulders. He forced Jared into his vehicle and threatened to shoot him. After being sexually assaulted, he was then allowed to go home as long as he ran away and never looked back, the same thing Jacob's abductor would tell Trevor and Aaron nine months later. Heinrich was arrested for the crime and interviewed by FBI agents that didn't know he was a suspect in the Painesville assaults. Also, they were allegedly inexperienced and observed the interrogation and told detectives they didn't think Heinrich was guilty and he was shockingly released. As for the lineup, no one picked out Heinrich, but Jared wasn't given a chance to hear the men talk so he could tell if their voices matched his abductor. Oddly, neither Trevor nor Aaron was present at the lineup, nor any of the seven Painesville boys that were molested. In early 1991, high-ranking law enforcement investigators interviewed Dwayne Hart in prison. Hart was an early suspect in Jacob's case, a convicted sex offender from Painesville, and a longtime acquaintance of the Heinrich family. Hart told the investigators he visited Heinrich's apartment the month Jacob was kidnapped. He said he saw a handgun, two police scanners, and a black ninja-type suit. Also, Heinrich had asked Hart how to dispose of a body. Hart recommended wrapping it in plastic and leaving it at a sewage treatment plant. Nothing ever came of the interview, and there was reportedly no follow-up with Heinrich. Years later, it was revealed 
that Jacob was initially buried on Sewage Pond Road, suggesting that Heinrich took Hart's recommendation. Two weeks after Jacob's kidnapping, a composite drawing was released of a man who was seen acting suspiciously at the same store the boys had visited that night and a quick mark in Avon shortly before the abduction. A week after that, two more sketches were released, one of a man who talked about the incident and another of a man suspected of trying to kidnap a new Brighton boy. Then, nearly a month after Jacob went missing, a detailed description of a car involved in the attempted abduction of a 13-year-old boy in Roberts, Wisconsin was released. Finally, the FBI released another sketch that blended all three sketches together. They did this because agents believed all three sightings could have been the same man. Trevor and Aaron were both hypnotized and neither saw or heard a car at the abduction site. So, after many years, it was thought that there was no reason a man would have come off the highway searching for children at that time of night. Instead, the kidnapper likely lived nearby, saw the boys go by, and knew they would be coming back his way. Without any other car leads, investigators turned their sights on Dan Razier. Razier became a person of interest, and rumors spread about his possible involvement ruining his reputation with many in the community. With a search warrant, the Razier family farm was searched back in the summer of 2010 while Dan Razier still lived with his parents, who were now elderly, in the same house. The police took six truckloads of dirt away from the farm and did some other investigating. A couple of the things taken were a box of newspaper clippings about Jacob's abduction and excerpts from a journal with Dan's thoughts about the case. He lived with his parents on a farm, the one that was at the end of the driveway in the house closest to the spot where Jacob was taken. Dan also called the police to report a car turning around in his driveway that night. His parents were out of town the night Jacob was abducted, and he was home alone. Nothing of evidentiary value came from that search, but he remained a person of interest. Meanwhile, Jacob's mother, Patty, became an activist and an advocate for children. After Jacob's abduction, Patty and Jerry formed the Jacob Wetterling Foundation. In 1994, the Jacob Wetterling Act was established to mandate that states register sex offenders. This was the first law to institute a state sex offender registry. In 2008, the foundation became the Jacob Wetterling Resource Center. It is dedicated to spreading education and awareness about sexual predators, how it happens, who takes them, and what we can do to prevent them. The law has been amended several times, most famously by Megan's Law in 1996 and the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act in 2006. Megan's Law expanded the mandate community notification so we can now go to our iPhone apps and find out who the registered sex offenders are around us. So, if you quickly search your surrounding area, you may likely be surprised at the number of registered sex offenders in your neighborhood and their addresses. Fast forward to October 28, 2015, Danny Heinrich was finally announced to be a person of interest. It turns out that several weeks after Jacob's abduction, Heinrich was questioned by the FBI, but they didn't have enough to link him to Jacob's abduction. But Heinrich's DNA was eventually connected to the kidnapping of Jared Shirell through DNA on Jared's sweater. Shockingly, the statute of limitations had expired and they couldn't arrest or hold him accountable. Still, it was a good enough reason for them to search his house. During the search, they found child pornography and immediately arrested him. Heinrich then began cooperating with the authorities as part of an unusual plea deal. Heinrich agreed to plead guilty to one count of the 25 federal child pornography charges brought against him in the plea agreement. The plea agreement stated that Heinrich had to reveal the location of Jacob's body and give details of the abduction and murder. On September 1, 2016, he showed the FBI where he buried Jacob. His remains were recovered and dental records positively identified him. Heinrich confessed in court the details of what he did to Jacob. 
He said he was driving on that dead-end road that night when he noticed three boys on their bicycles with a flashlight. Heinrich says after he handcuffed Jacob and drove away, Jacob asked what he had done wrong and began crying. He then drove 30 miles to Painesville, where he sexually assaulted him. He said that he was able to avoid police by listening to a police scanner. He said he heard police sirens, but they had nothing to do with him. He thought they were coming for him and got scared and panicked. He said he told Jacob to turn around and raised a revolver to Jacob's head, but the gun jammed. With Jacob still standing, Heinrich said he pulled the trigger a second time and Jacob fell to the ground. Heinrich walked back to his home and returned a couple of hours later to bury Jacob in a shallow grave. A year later, he returned and saw that the remains were partially uncovered. He could even see Jacob's jacket, so he moved the bones close to a farm across the highway where he dug a trench two feet deep, and that's where Jacob remained for nearly 27 years. Heinrich was only sentenced for one count of child pornography, which carries a maximum prison sentence of 20 years, despite confessing to abducting two boys, sexually assaulting them, and killing one. In January 2017, Heinrich was transferred to a federal prison in Massachusetts to serve his 20-year sentence. He is scheduled to be released on the child pornography charges in 2033, when he is 70 years old. So, Devens, Massachusetts, y'all better watch out. In 2018, Jared Sherrill was awarded $17 million in a suit against Heinrich, even though he is well aware that Heinrich has no money. Jared says he pursued a civil case against Heinrich after he was told that the criminal statute of limitations had expired in his case. Even though Jared's claims were largely ignored, he remained adamant to authorities that Jacob's kidnapper was the same man that kidnapped him. Patty Wetterling again expressed her gratitude to Jared, saying without his tireless efforts, the 27-year mystery of the kidnapping and murder of her son would never have been solved. Madison Marie Walb was born on December 13, 1993, and went by Maddie. She lived in Reading, Pennsylvania, and graduated from Exeter High School in 2012. At the age of 23, Maddie worked as a mail sorter for Pitney Bowes. She was described as loving, always the life of the party, and adored her nieces and nephews. But she fell on hard times when she began struggling with opioid addiction, turned heroin addiction over a four-year period. On October 8, 2017, her body was tragically found wrapped in carpet on the side of Regal Road in a field near Faust Road in Lower Heidelberg Township. Her cause of death was a close contact gunshot wound, and her thumbprint was used to identify her. A friend of Maddie's said he last saw her early in the morning on October 6 when she left a restaurant on the 800 block of Penn Street in Reading, heading towards South 8th Street. During the investigation, video surveillance was discovered that showed Maddie entering an apartment at 800 Franklin Street at 1.05 a.m. Around 1.45 a.m., a woman named Carmen and her brother Christopher Morales Feliciano were seen exiting the apartment. At 2.37 a.m., Christopher and a friend of his, Christian Carmono Lanos, returned to the apartment. A short time later, they are seen carrying a large, rolled-up carpet with Maddie's arm dangling out of it, and they carried it to a waiting vehicle that had just arrived at the apartment. As the investigation continued, another witness told detectives that Carmen had admitted to shooting Maddie. They said she shot Maddie execution style and then met up with her brother Christopher and friend Christian at a corner store to devise a plan to, as they said, throw her away. Another witness said after disposing of her body, Carmen returned to the apartment and opened the trap house to continue selling drugs. Video surveillance showed Carmen making hand-to-hand -hand controlled substance deliveries both before and after Maddie's murder. After reviewing all of this evidence, a grand jury recommended criminal charges. Both Carmen and Christopher were already in custody on unrelated charges when the grand jury recommended charges. 
Christian, on the other hand, was at large and had to be tracked down and arrested. On October 11, 2017, authorities raided the apartment where Maddie was murdered. Carmen pleaded guilty to third-degree murder, corpse abuse, drug trafficking, and other charges. She was sentenced to 22 and a half to 50 years in prison, as agreed to in her plea deal, and received credit for 768 days served. She also pleaded guilty to tampering with evidence, conspiracy, and five counts related to heroin and cocaine trafficking, including three from a separate arrest. Prosecutors never discussed whether she had a motive for the shooting. Her brother, Christopher, pleaded guilty to abuse of a corpse, criminal conspiracy, and tampering with evidence. He was sentenced to seven and a half to 25 years in state prison. The third suspect in the case, Christian, was charged with abuse of a corpse, criminal conspiracy, and tampering with physical evidence. Deborah Kathleen Tomlinson was born to parents Jim and Dora on June 11, 1956. She went by Debbie and was outgoing, passionate about horses, and a very good student. At the age of 19, she was a student at Colorado Mesa University and lived alone in an apartment on the 1000 block of Belford Avenue in Grand Junction, Colorado. However, two days after Christmas in 1975, her life was sadly cut short. She was found deceased in her bathtub, having been bound, sexually assaulted, and strangled to death. Thankfully, even with it being 1975 and way before DNA was used to solve crimes, investigators collected and preserved the DNA found on her body. The primary suspect at the time was Debbie's uncle, and the officers extensively looked into him until a year later when he was cleared of all suspicion. Meanwhile, within four months of her murder, the case went cold until 2019 when detectives reopened it. Nobody who originally worked the case was still on the force, and so the new detectives had to start pouring over old notes and interviews. Interestingly though, each of the original detectives at the crime scene had used a different colored pen when making notes so that years later, others could see their different interpretations of what they saw. In 2020, using DNA evidence, a DNA profile was created and used for genetic genealogy. As a result, Parabon was able to narrow down the possibilities before a final list of leads was produced. Those leads eventually led to suspect Jimmy Dean Duncan, but authorities couldn't collect DNA from Duncan because he died in 1987 of natural causes in his late 30s. So investigators contacted Duncan's brother, who provided his DNA instead. The DNA was a match and proved that Jimmy Dean Duncan was in fact Deborah Tomlinson's killer, officially solving the case 45 years later. At first, authorities couldn't find a connection between Duncan and Deborah, but investigators theorized that Duncan had a relative who lived near Debbie's college, and they might have possibly met while he was visiting the relative. He was 26 at the time of the murder, and his criminal history showed a previous robbery and a separate shooting in Florida. Thankfully, Debbie's 82-year-old father was still alive to see his daughter's murder solved. 